This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And how great it is to see that you have come to join in worship and rejoice with us in the Lord. Hey, if you're like me, are there some days that you just wake up and you're just so excited about what the day is going to bring? I woke up this morning and I said, what could be, I can't decide which could be more exciting, to meet Dr. Lester, who will serve as transitional pastor, or to have a word from Bill Kirkland of introduction. <laughs> be still my heart. The excitement is overwhelming, but Mr. Kirkland, do you have an introduction to make? We didn't have Mark where we would be, you know. Uh, it is our pleasure to introduce to you our next interim pastor and his wife. This is Dr. Terry Lester and his wife, Janet Lester. They have long ties to Franklin County, and Janet grew up here. She was a Costigan, and most of you know the Costigan name and have known the Costigans over the years. Uh, Terry uh, is a cooperative Baptist. He has d seminary degrees from Louisville Southern Baptist Seminary, and he also has a doctorate of ministry degree from <clears throat> Lexington Theological Seminary. He served 28 years as the senior pastor uh, First Baptist Church in London, Kentucky, a church of 800 members. And while he was there for the 28-year period, he built a whole campus for that church. In 2015, the Lesters retired from London and came back to Frankfurt, where they had older relatives here. And after that time, in 2015, uh, Dr. Lester has served three interims in Christian Disciples of Christ churches, and he served a recent short interim at Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Frankfurt. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Lester is a thinker and a scholar. He has authored three books, and we are very fortunate that he has agreed to serve as our interim minister. Presbytery gladly and warmly approved him on October 2nd, so he has agreed to serve uh, as our interim pastor, and we don't know how long that'll be. Uh, and he would like to say just a few words, he says. Thank you, Bill was a privilege to be able to meet your wonderful committee and spend some time with them. 
I also had the joy of spending some time with Marion Taylor and visiting with her here at the church and got a tour of your beautiful facility here. And let me say, we are just very thankful for this opportunity to serve the Lord, to get to know you as brothers and sisters in Christ, and share this time together as God's people. Uh, we have, as Bill shared, uh, strong Frankfurt ties, and I have had the joy of serving not only Baptist churches, but Disciples of Christ churches, and I think I shared maybe with the committee, I preached at First Presbyterian London last November, so uh, I, I am a Baptist by training, early training, and, and my work in churches, yet I believe I'm a follower of Christ, first and foremost. And I don't get hung up on any of the denominational labels or those sorts of things. So I just look forward to sharing this time with you. I will do my best to be a faithful preacher, a caring pastor, and I look forward to get, getting to know you and will pray with you as you begin this journey in search of a new pastor here at South Frankfurt Presbyterian. So I look forward to meeting you. Bless you. And in good news, in good Presbyterian order, you've heard that Terry has met with our Committee on Ministry. I can say that um, we, it's already been announced that you're, you've been received in, into, uh, well, it's been approved, because uh, you're not going to be received into membership of Presbyterian. You have to be a Presbyterian to do that. So some denominational things come into play. But we certainly do like to welcome you and would welcome you to the Presbyterian, the fellowship that we have as Presbyterians. It is a day of excitement. Let us show God our excitement in prayer. So gracious God, we give you thanks for new beginnings. Each day we awake and it's new and fresh because of you and your spirit moving among us. This day we would pray that your spirit move among the congregation and among Dr. and Mrs. Lester as we begin a new journey, as we journey together in what has been established, as we find pathways to serve you better to love you more, and to love our neighbor even as you love us. Gracious God, show us your ways in all that we do and say. Amen. Hey, hey, hey roll it. We still have announcements. <laughs> See, excitement is everywhere. Excited to play. Well, one of the exciting things, too, is as we look at ministries and continuing ministries, is how we do serve in mission. Um, Beth, you want to tell us about the mission project? You may have seen in the newsletter this week uh, a mission that the outreach committee wishes to uh, present to you and that is blankets for the men's shelter. I hope you saw that. Um, Brian Pedigo is the managing director of the shelter. And when I asked about what could you use in the way of supplies, he said blankets would be, would be wonderful. Now, these blankets can be new, gently used, twin or double bed size. That's, those are the stipulations that he would like to, for us to consider. So, get in there, look at your closets. I bet there's some of those blankets that you have not used in a long time. And if so, bring them to church. We have a, a container in the back of the vestibule here and one in Fellowship Hall. And any, any, anything you can contribute, you know that it will be well used and appreciated by the men's shelter. Thank you. And are there any other announcements to be made? Yes, sir.
And we will turn to one worship note. I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, the anthem is not listed in the bulletin, but we will have our anthem um, um, this morning um, after our hymn and before the children's time. Would you like to tell us what the anthem will be, and then you can just move to it. So. Our anthem today is a group project. <laughs> um, we have our adult bell ringers, and we have some child narrators. Um, the title is Joseph and the Coat, where you will get to see the beautiful coat that the children of our church have decorated. Great, thank you. Roland, I think it's time. <laughs> O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We sing to the Lord and bless God's name. We tell of God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations, God's marvelous works among all peoples. Praise the Lord and to your prayers. Ascribe to the Lord, O oh, families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Bring an offering, come into God's courts, and give God the glory due to the Lord's name.
we gather to worship God, knowing this, that the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Christ, we dare with confidence to approach God in confession. So let us ask God to forgive us, and let us pray together. God of majesty, you have drawn near to us, but we have turned away from your light. You have chosen us to be your people, but we confess that we have lived as though we belong to ourselves. We do not recognize your goodness, which is all around us, and we do not allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit who empowers us to live as people who glorify you. Forgive us for going the way of the world, forgetting your law of love toward you and neighbor. Empower us by your Spirit to be faithful followers of Jesus, who taught us by word and example how to live as your children to your honor and to your glory. So who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, and Christ prays for us. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And I declare to you, that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
ago, in the land of Canaan, lived a farmer named Jacob. Jacob had a very large family. They all helped to farm the land and to take care of the animals. There were 12 sons. Their names were... Well, anyway, take my word for it. There were 12 sons. However, Jacob made the mistake of openly favoriting one of his younger sons above all the rest. Oh yes, Jacob loved Joseph more, much more than the other boys. He even gave Joseph a beautiful rainbow colored coat made from the wool of his finest sheep. When Joseph's brothers saw him wearing his new coat, they became jealous. They felt their father had been unfair to them. They said to one another, Joseph's attitude didn't help the situation. In his brightly colored coat, he stood tall before his brothers and told them the dreams he had during the night. In one of my dreams, my grain stalks was standing up. And your grain stalks were bowing down in front of mine. In another dream, even the sun, the moon, and 11 stars kneeled in my presence. Well, this only made the brothers more jealous and angry. But Reuben, the oldest, said, Nah, let's just drop him into a pit and scare him a little. And that's exactly what they did. It was a long until some of his brothers spotted Ishmaelites traveling in a camel caravan to Egypt. Here's our chance, they said to one another. Reuben isn't here to stop us. Let's sell our snooty brother to these people as a slave. Quick as a flash, the deal was done. However, just as the caravan left, Reuben returned. Where's Joseph? He asked. Then the brothers realized they still had a problem. True, they had gotten rid of their boastful brother, but now they had to explain it to their father, Jacob. They panicked. Yeah. 
When Jacob heard the news about Joseph, he tore his clothes and mourned for his son. His family tried to comfort him, but Jacob continued to grieve. Isn't this a sad story? Jacob's mistake of favoring Joseph over his other sons caused hurt feelings. The brothers reacted to Joseph with the sin of jealousy, and Joseph was just a little too prideful of being his father's favorite son. We can learn a lesson from this story. You see when people sin against each other and disobeys God's law to love one another, then unhappy times are sure to come. Oh yes. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, he was sold as a slave to Potiphar, captain of Pharaoh's army. Salute! Joseph was all alone now, and his prideful spirit began to change. He cried out to God for help, and God heard him. He blessed Joseph and made him the chief servant in Potiphar's house. Joseph obeyed God and was an honest and trustworthy servant. But then, one day, Joseph was thrown into prison for something he didn't even do. Talk about having the blues. Joseph had a choice to make. Would he become angry with God for this unfair treatment? Or would he continue to trust God and be obedient? Happily, he made a wise decision. He chose to believe God no matter what happened. Soon, God blessed Joseph and made him the chief servant of the prison. Then, two years later, Pharaoh called for Joseph to come before him. He had heard that Joseph could explain his strange dreams. Dreams about seven fat cows and seven skinny cows, seven good corn ears and seven bad corn on the cobs. Joseph told Pharaoh that it meant there would be seven years of plenty for Egypt. Then seven years of fam and great need. Pharaoh was so impressed that he gave Joseph some fine gifts, a ring, a gold chain, beautiful clothes, and a chariot. He also made Joseph governor of all the land. Okay, okay, the brothers. Well, when the seven bad years of famine came, there was no more food in Canaan, so Jacob had to send his sons to Egypt to buy grain. When they arrived there, they went straight to the Pharaoh's governor. The brothers didn't recognize Joseph, but he knew exactly who they were. They bowed down before Joseph and pleaded for food to take back home. Of course, Joseph wanted to help them, but first he had to see if they had repented of their jealousy and evil deeds. So he tested them. He pretended to accuse them of spying. He threatened to enslave Benjamin, the youngest. The brothers became very distressed. At 
last, Joseph began to weep, and he told his brothers who he was. Then they all started to cry and hugged each other. The brothers confessed how rotten they had been, and Joseph forgave him. The Pharaoh gave Joseph's family rich farmland in Egypt and all the food they needed to get through the famine. Now they all lived together as a happy family. Everyone was so proud of Joseph. This story should inspire us to live by God's law to, of love even in unfair circumstances. You see, oh, although Joseph no longer had a coat of many colors from his earthly father, Jacob, he now has family and many wonderful blessings from God, his heavenly Father. Have all my kids with your pieces of the coat come up front with me. Stand up, turn around, face the congregation. Hey, so let's let Rocky get up front. Let's let Poppy get up front. <laughs> Hayes, why don't you come back here with me? You're tall. All right, ready? Everybody? One, two, three. Did I shine my shoes today? Yes, I shine my shoes today. Good work. All right. Sit on the front, please. Amazing, you all. And, you know, I, I said, do we need a children's time today? You all kind of did the children's time for us. But it's interesting because the story I prepared for you today is about forgiveness. I'm going to get you to put those down because that's kind of making me nervous. <laughs> those are kind of sharp. I want to show you something, though. I'll show you my own pencils. So I want, I want you to look at my pencils and somebody tell me what is the same about all those pencils? Yeah, they're all pencils. Mm -hmm. What's different about them? Some of them are mechanical and some of them... Poppy, you are exactly right. They don't have erasers. And you know why they don't have erasers is because I made a lot of mistakes. And when I make mistakes when I'm writing, which I do a lot of, I use up the erasers. Does that ever happen to you? Yes, I've seen children a lot of time in school and their erasers are gone. And so this is really helps me think about a story today, which is that we all make mistakes. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's tall, short, fat, skinny. They're, you know, different colors. But one of the things that we all have in common is that we all make mistakes. The only person that doesn't mistake, make mistakes is God. But the person who helps us always forgives our mistakes is God. That's the reason why Jesus died on the cross, was to forgive us of our mistakes. And, you know, I was thinking about this story when I was hearing you all talk about, um, about uh, the Joseph and the coat of many colors. Yeah, yeah. And so it really is kind of a story of forgiveness. And the story of forgiveness is that has anybody ever done anything that's hurt your feelings? 
Tell me something that somebody's done to hurt your feelings, Hayes. Somebody made you feel left out, maybe and didn't invite you to do something or ignored you. Has anybody ever hurt your feelings, BT? What? Can't remember? Anybody else had their feelings hurt before? Yeah, Poppy, when somebody hurt your feelings? Can't remember? Lawton. Yeah, Poppy came to church today. I'm very sick. Oh, I'm sorry that that hurts your feelings. That makes me happy. What do you think, Maggie? Somebody hurt your feelings before? Um, they left me out. Yeah, they left you out. That hurts. Like if somebody has a party and they don't invite you. And so there's a story in the Bible where one of Jesus' followers, Peter, says, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody if they do something that hurts my feelings? Seven times? And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said seven times 70, which I'm not very good at math, but I know that that's a whole lot. And so, but I don't think that he meant that specific number. I think he said, meant, meant that we're supposed to do it over and over and over again. And so, just like uh, Joseph uh, 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 forgave his brothers, even though they did horrible things to him, that's what we're supposed to do, and that's what Jesus directs us to do. So let's say a prayer together. Dear Father, we all sin and fall short. Thank you for sending Jesus to get, forgive us for our sins. Help us to forgive others the same way. Over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. I always need that reminder that God doesn't make mistakes. I, I swear that when I see the Lord in glory one day and we can speak face to face, I'm going to ask God about cockroaches and gnats. But other than that, God's done a pretty good job. Yeah, I was going to add mosquitoes, but lots of things eat mosquitoes too. <laughs> but I'll include it. Let us pray together. We stand in all of you, O oh God. We rejoice that you have chosen us to be your own. By your word, the heavens were made. Your kindness fills the whole earth. By the bounty of your mercy, we have been born to new life. Now in the hearing of your word, may we be refreshed by your spirit and be renewed in our efforts to follow in all your ways. The first lesson for this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 to 23. Hear this word of God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And the Lord said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, 
unless you go with us. In this way, we shall be distinct. And I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, the Lord said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. But then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. To sense the lesson from the Old Testament, the New Testament lesson comes today from the letter to Paul to the Thessalonians. So hear this, this word, too, of God. It is a letter and starts with a salutation. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father all your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that God has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy from the Holy Spirit that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The word of the Lord has sounded forth from not only you in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For they report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. I really can't say enough good about you. I really can't say enough good about you. So echoes Paul's sentiment at the beginning of the Thessalonians when he writes his letter. He writes to a young church. He writes to a church that he sees filled with promise and hope and good things, and he has ample reason to express thanks for them in his prayers. He has no doubt of God's work in them. People enjoy speaking of their faith, and Paul can hold on and hold them up as exemplary. Yet all is not perfect. Paul will address this. Paul utilizes the opportunity to write to this church, uh, this opportunity of praise, to inject some hope as well. Hope. Hope that it can even be better. I really can't say enough good about you. About you. Now, Paul has a source of hope hope. And what I hope to do in working through scripture of this day is to find some of that source and some of that beginning. So let's go back to Exodus for a moment and take a look at this story that we've heard. Now we're entering this Sunday in the lectionary readings of the day into the midst of an ongoing argument between Moses and God about the shape of God's relationship with the newly formed people of God. 
This reading from Exodus 33 follows the story of the golden calf and can be understood fully only in light of that story and the longer story of the Exodus. So let's take a moment to look at the story of this golden calf. You'll remember that after bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God had initiated a special relationship with them, calling them from all the peoples of the, of the earth to be God's treasured possession. I can't say enough good about you. Yes, they were God's treasured possession, to be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. God had given them the Ten Commandments as their guide and instructions on building the tabernacle. God had even promised to dwell in the very midst of the Israelites, and the tabernacle was to be a visible sign of that abiding presence of God. The tabernacle was a sort of portable Mount Sinai, the place where God would dwell, where the place that God would be known, the place just where we would see God's glory, and just as it rested up on the mountain in a cloud, so would God's glory fill the tabernacle, the house that they would build. Let us build a house. God would be present with the people in a real and material way as they traveled through the wilderness. Amazing. God abiding and with us, and we shall see the glory of the Lord. Too good to be true. So that by the problem we know, of course, is that by the time now we get to the story in Exodus in chapter 33, the people have stumbled badly, horribly. They stumbled. What they decided to do, for they thought that maybe God wasn't with them and they hadn't trusted enough that God was with them, that they have betrayed their relationship with God by doing what? Making another image an idol, a golden calf, and they said, let us worship this one too. And they hurt God. Just as we heard children share hurts today, our own God was hurt. And he was angered. He was upset. So that right after the betrayal, Moses was upset. God was upset. And God is God's mind is changing about the shape of the relationship. God wanted to do something different. The Lord said to Moses, Go, leave this place. You and the people you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, and go to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to them, To your descendants I will give it. But here's the difference. Now God says, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Pezrites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, or I would consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. See what's beginning to happen? See? God now, who has been with the people, abided with the people, they have seen and known God's glory by cloud and fire, and they know that God was with them. God is now saying, I'm not going to go with you. I'll send an angel. The Lord will send an angel, but will not go by himself. The Lord is not going to abandon the people. I mean, he, God will be true to the covenant made with them at Sinai, but God will not be present with them in the way originally planned. The Lord's abiding, dwelling presence will not go with the Israelites as they now journey through the wilderness. And it's for their own good, says the Lord. The holiness of the Lord is such that it cannot abide with sin, the sin of taking on another image, finding another idol. For in that action, they turned from the God that they had known to another God. That's their sin. In a nutshell, you know, that's the theology of Leviticus. The people are sinful, stiff-necked, stubborn, it says. 
God's holiness would consume them on the way so God will not be present with them except in a less direct way, through a divine messenger, an angel. I won't go with you. Now, Moses begins to look at this and, and says, wait a minute, this is a game changer. And this is where the lesson from the Old Testament picked up this morning. That's where our reading comes in today. Moses, to put it mildly, is not satisfied with, God, with what God is saying now, and Moses doesn't want this new arrangement. Moses now has some chutzpah, to put it in a most perfect way. He's going to talk to God. We're going to be in dialogue about this, Lord. I'm not going to let this go. I'm not going to accept this. Moses is not afraid to use the Lord's own words against him in prayer. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of, of this text, puts it, puts it well and puts it this way. This is Moses talking to the Lord. Now, Lord, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You say, you're not going. Who's going with me? You tell, <clears throat> you tell me, I know you well, and you are special to me. See, that's what Moses heard. But if I am so special to you, let me in on your plans. That way, I will continue being special to you. Don't forget, this is your people and your responsibility. That was Moses' prayer. Moses is persuasive. The Lord does concede a bit. God does listen, and God does hear prayer. The translation of verse 14 that you heard will go with this. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. But there's more that the original Hebrew says in the language. There's no with you in the Hebrew. That's why Moses isn't willing to let the argument end. Moses is glad God gave a little, but now Moses is going to ask for a little more and say a little more. That's why Moses keeps pushing God in this passage about the matter, like a dog worrying a bone. Moses insists that God be explicit with God's promises. If your presence will not go, says Moses, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? That's how we're going to know your favor. And so then finally God concedes fully. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. God's mind changed. Changed not to go, then listening to how important it was that God's presence be with the people, God says, I'll go. It's no small thing that Moses did. Imagine persuading the creator of the universe to change a mind. So Moses now pushes his luck uh, just a little bit further. Well, then show me your glory, please, God. God will not do that. That's where the passage is ending that you heard. God will not show glory for Moses' own sake. He won't fulfill that request fully. Moses can see God's back, but not God's face. For it was written, for no one shall see me and live. But yet we will gaze upon the glory of the Lord. Now, commentators have long puzzled over this little part of the passage because in just a few verses earlier, it says that the Lord used to speak with Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. You've heard me even say that too. I, I hope to speak to God face to face and have an explanation of cockroaches. As belittling that is, there's that idea that we want to speak to God face to face. Now, it may seem as a contradiction, of course, and we can try to explain that contradiction 
from using different sources or traditions, but as the text as we have it now is kind of a central theme in Exodus that we do see the glory of God as it passes by. But the amazing thing even in that is that we see a God who wants to abide with finite human beings. God will abide with us. Now, that God chooses, changes the mind to abide with human beings is an astonishing thing indeed. And we'll always hear of this abiding of God with us. Abide with me. God chooses to do that. God chooses to be in a relationship with human beings that means that God makes himself vulnerable to the pain that ensues when that relationship is betrayed. But it also means that authentic communication, relationship with God is possible. Communication face to face. And Moses at this moment is the model for us of that sort of authentic, divine, human relationship. For me, when I think about that possibility and how much God wants to be present with us, I'm always filled with hope because God does yet stay with us. And God is with us. And God shows us ways through the wilderness. And in many ways, because we cling to God, we have that glimpse of glory and reflect that glory, that part of the image of God that is in us, that light of God, the image. Now, there's one little passage thinking about image that, that you did not hear today that it comes from the lectionary. The lectionary passage, if I had read the gospel from Matthew today, has something from image. You know the passage well without, me, uh, without reading it. It's when Jesus was tested um, by the Pharisee and Herodians. Uh, he, was, he was tested in this way. Messengers were sent and they asked Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes? It was a trap. They wanted to try to get Jesus caught up. But Jesus surprised them. Jesus said to them, bring me a coin. He looked at the coin, and whose image is here on this coin? And that's, he said, well, Caesar's image is here. It's a Roman coin, of course. And you know the passage then quite well. You've heard it usually in stewardship sermons. The image, that passage, render to Caesar, what is Caesar's? But give to God, what is God's? Now, here's an interesting thing. We, we have Jesus asking about an image. And in this case, uh, not a good image. It was Caesar, the oppressor, but it was also a graven idol image, much like the golden calf. It was another God, hail Caesar, so give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. But if we think about the idea of image, how do we see the image of God? How do we know the image of God? And now we quickly will go to Thessalonians to see this theme that comes through here in the image of God. It comes through hope, I think. Hope that we can have. Now, we know well the triad of, of, of faith, hope, and love. We hear that, of course, and we hear faith, hope, and love, and we think, of course, 1 Corinthians 13. But it's interesting that in this passage, in this beginning of the letter to the Thessalonians, when Paul is so excited about seeing the Thessalonians, hearing of the Thessalonians, writing to the Thessalonians, I can't say enough good about you. He has faith, hope, and love. 
mentioned in the beginning of the letter, not necessarily in that same order. Um, that were, that's the order of, of Corinthians, but it's faith, love, and hope. But still, that triad. And he's talking to them about their source of hope, for they were persecuted people as well, and yet they clung to faith, knowing the love of God. He's encouraging them. He's lifting them up. He's holding them true because I believe in some ways he's looking at who are you loyal to? Whose image are you carrying? Because later he'll say, you are imitators of us even as we are of Christ. See, there's that image carrying that glory of God. You have a loyalty and your loyalty is in God. And if we think about it, loyalties have much to say about choosing in what and in whom we will place our hope. He talks about hope. How can Paul talk about this? Because he has an experience with a resurrected Christ. Just as Moses had an experience with a God who was present, now we know a resurrected Christ who is a new presence of God, alive for us, assuring us of salvation. Yes, he has received, Paul will write, a revelation of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say to the Thessalonians, they are there, just have hope. He can speak of his experience of hope, his loyalty to Christ who was died and was raised. So let's think a moment about loyalties and how we place them in our own society. Where do we locate loyalty? You know, we can say um, we have hope perhaps in a particular political party, and political figures because we agree with what they say. We could say that we have hope in authoritative teachers who can help us to learn. I can place my hope here because I'm learning through, through new things. We can have hope in all kinds of ways because we hear a message that gives us hope. But ultimately, any of these words as Christians, we need to see what is giving us and learning, and where are we learning hope in Jesus Christ, bearing God's image. Yes, we can have hope. We must have hope. And when we have that, we are able to have hope not because of blindly leading after something, but because we have experienced something that makes hope possible. See, Moses could have conversation with God and encourage and ask God to change a mind because he had that experience of God with him. Jesus could say to the people, here is one image, but let's have the image of God. Be loyal to God and make sure we give to God what is God's. And now Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, we rejoice in you and we look to you because even though you have some bad times, your loyalty is with God and you bear God's image, be imitators of Christ, even as we imitate Christ. <clears throat> so hope, it's born again and born anew and born here this day which in some ways is a day of new beginning sure you'll have a transitional pastor who begins and sure we hear things about hurts and pains that children may have, but we give them hope. And sure, we see the bell choir talking and singing and ringing and mixing it all up together about Joseph having hope. And we see hope when adults and children can work together on a church project. We have hope as we remain 
loyal to Christ. So in the days ahead, from this new day, you will have the opportunities to ask yourself, how is it and how do we need to have those amongst us who will help us bear that image of Christ to be loyal and then show God's glory in this house that you shall name glory. God bless you as you are imitators of Christ. Paul talks about this same church in 2 Corinthians. I want to read this passage to you as we prepare to give our offering and bear the image of Christ in doing so. This is what Paul writes to the Corinthians, talking about the Thessalonians, the people, the churches of Macedonia, which are Thessaloniki and, and Philippi. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. Begging for the, to share in the ministry to the saints. And in our giving, we beg and we share and we see God's glory. The morning offering will be received. Oh, I've got a favor to ask. You know, after you give, we're used to the doxology, which isn't in the bulletin. Can we sing the doxology? Is that possible? Sure. Sure. <laughs> And let us pray together. Holy God, source of every good gift, 
The offerings we bring to you are simply a token of our desire to walk more closely beside you. We give, knowing that giving you what is yours would mean leaving everything at your altar, all that we have and all that we are. We are not there yet, but with your help, we are on the road to getting there. Bless what we give. May it speak words of compassion, mercy, and love as it empowers your mission and ministry. We pray this in the name of Jesus, whose light we seek to follow. Amen. And please be seated. And we turn now to a, God, uh, to a time of prayer. Let us pray together. Loving, living God, be among us now. You are present to us in so many ways. We know this and are thankful that you abide with us. So show us your ways as you guide our steps. Live in us, O Lord, that we may be people of steadfast hope and powerful giving. Help us to hear your words, challenging us to give you all the things that are yours. Help us remember that all we are and all that we have are gifts from you, gifts to be shared in service and love. Holy One among us, help us to be a holy people who receive your word with joy and live your message with love. God, we know that you see everything that happens in this world. Nothing that we pray about is news to you. Yet we still pray, asking that your peace and wisdom rest upon us and your presence transform our lives as we work for the trans transformation of this world today. That peace may be found. We pray for those across the world and in our communities who are scared today, for those who face violence and war because of where they live or where they work or who they have created them to be. For those whose future seems dark, we pray for them. For those whose anxiety eats away at them and who cannot find peace, spirit, living flame, encourage them and help us to bring your peace and light to those places. We pray for those who hurt today, for the sick, the hungry, the abused, the grieving, the lonely. We pray for those who struggle with pain in body or mind or spirit. We pray for the compassionate who hurt because the world hurts. And we would ask Jesus, our healer, comfort them and help us to be a comfort. We pray for those who may have woken up angry today. We pray for those who feel excluded, overlooked, or trapped. We pray for those who feel entitled, unappreciated, out of control. We pray that where anger leads to pain, you would bring peace. But where anger leads to justice, you would be, bring wisdom. Jesus, you are a table turner. You change things. You move people. So guide them. Guide us. And we pray for those who are full of hope today, O oh God. We pray for those who are beginning new relationships or careers or working to get clean. We pray for those who see sprouts of your kingdom poking through cracks in the sidewalk. We pray for those who are a light in darkness. We give you thanks, O oh God, that even as your sunlight streams into this holy place, that we would glimpse your glory and your light, and that we know that we can be light bearers to this world. So strengthen all of us who are full of hope. Strengthen us through your Holy Spirit. These prayers we lift you always, O oh God, that we might be attuned to the needs of your children, to their laughter and to their cries. We also lift to you now the specific concerns that we may have on our own hearts this day. And gracious God, 
There may be much that we have forgotten to pray for today, yet we know that nothing escapes your notice. Direct our eyes this coming week, we pray, that we might come to know your heart more fully, and in knowing your heart, be filled with hope and your image. And so we pray. We pray as those who bear your image, saying the prayer taught the one who came to show us. We pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so remain seated as we say what we believe using the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. As you know, a catechism is question and answer. We learn through question and answer. And so I ask this question to you, which you'll respond. Since we are redeemed from our sin and its wretched consequences by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why must we do good works? Following the benediction, I'll invite the Lesters to stand in front of the the bells here so that you have a chance to to greet them, if you'll do that. And I guess the temptation would be, since the bell's there, just like going out of a good restaurant, ring the bell if you've been made happy. But we go, oh, what, what? Not without gloves. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's right. Never mind. Leave, leave Leave the bells alone. We go now in peace. And may the glory of the Lord be all around you. 
here in this sanctuary, but know that the glory of the Lord will glimmer also in your house and in your car and in your office, at the grocery store, at the gym, in the garden, and along the street, everywhere you go, everywhere the children of God goes, so does the image of God. Bear that image. So bearing invisible glory that makes you brave. And may the love of God go with you to be brave and strong, the peace of Christ to make you kind, and the power of the Spirit to make you alive today and tomorrow. Go with God's blessing to be God's glory. Amen. Amen.